Assalamu alaikum. Marhaban bikum fi Jannah, Australia, fi Expo 2020 Dubai. Ana ismi Claire, wana naibat al mafawd al amli Australia fi Expo. Welcome everyone to the Australian Pavilion at Expo 2020. We are delighted to be hosting this event here today in partnership with Expo and the wonderful team from Asarkal who are behind the Cultures in Conversation event series here. The topic of today's event is, I think, very close to Australia's heart. We're, of course, a farming country. We've got a keen interest in the sustainability of food production and in agricultural science and technology. But we also like to eat and we have a vibrant culinary culture influenced by indigenous ingredients and culture as well as the cultures of all the people from around the world who've come to make Australia their home. And I think that's really part of the magic of Expo 2020 as well, that so many countries are coming here together in one place to share their cultures, their ideas, their knowledge um, with the rest of the world. And so I'd just like to wish you all a very enjoyable and thought-provoking session here today and tour of the world through food. And on that note, I'll hand over to Fiza Akram to get things underway. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Claire. I'll start by thanking um, the Australia Pavilion for hosting us, our partners and speakers. My name is Fiza Akram, and I'm the Special Projects Director at Al Sarkal. Thank you for joining us today. Key ingredients, the future, future of food, is part of Cultures in Conversation, an unconventional series of conversations, experiences, and artistic interventions commissioned by Expo 2020 and programmed by Ulcer Kahl. In partnering with Expo to ex conceptualize cultures in conversation, Ulcer Kahl Advisory has worked with multidisciplinary artists and thinkers to create programming that reimagines critical contemporary issues. By engaging with these topics, the program opens unexpected avenues of questioning and reflection. Today's event marks the ninth of 10 them themed weeks and is devoted to food, agriculture, and livelihood in association with the Food and Water Security Office and PepsiCo. So, for the fun part, the format of today's presentations will be a pachakacha, a storytelling format devised by architects Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham where presenters are limited to 20 slides for 20 seconds each. Why? Because architects talk too much. The first Pachakacha night was held in Tokyo in February 2003, and it is now present in 1,234 cities globally and has over 23,000 presentations online. At Al Sarkal, we started our Pachakacha journey in 2018 and are delighted to be part of this wonderful family of talks. Today's eight speakers will be sharing their insights as artists, entrepreneurs, researchers, and scientists on how our interactions and practices with food have shaped our heritage and culture and evolved to affect our traditions, practices, and most importantly, our environment. I'll be introducing the speakers up front and then the presentations will go back to back. First up, we have Andrea Provenzano of the Black Almanac, who ruminates on the evolution of early agricultural and food practices toward contemporary factory kitchens. We'll also gain insight into Tancha Vora's research on the ancient Indian tradition of insect eating and overcoming the social hurdles to adapt the practice in our daily nutrition. Similarly, Salma Sari's storytelling approach untangles food in class migration and culture as it occurs in Egypt and the Arab Gulf. Salma Boualia shares the significant impact of identifying origins and highlighting untold stories through the Storybird, a platform that empowers consumers to contribute to a more effective and responsible ecosystem. These practices can be seen through the examples set by Mario Bernardi and Mark Tester. Through his contribution to Farmelody, Mark will explain how data is utilized to drastically reduce the impact of livestock farming and food production on the environment. Then Mark, as professor of plant science, will walk you through Red Sea Farm's approach to sustainable food production by developing agricultural systems that rely on seawater. Finally, as practicing entrepreneurs of their time, Daniel Solomon and Patrick Jarjul will share some of the initiatives food entrepreneurs have taken to provide audiences with the means to, service, to act responsibly. Once the pachakacha is done, the artist, artistic intervention will begin. Title, this is not a food tour. The artistic intervention is led by Deepak Anni Krishnan and is a playful sensorial version of his illustrious street food 
course taught at NYUAD. The course explores visibility and exclusion in urban settings through the prism of street eateries. Those who have registered for the tour will have a lanyard with yellow text on it and will make their way upstairs with us. Everyone who has a lanyard with blue text will be expedited through a tour of the pavilion, which I highly recommend if you are interested. Thank you for joining us and I will get started before you know it. All right, let's talk about how we are cooking our planet. Recent studies in anthropology and archaeology shows that uh, human society has been transforming uh, our planet for millennia. Uh, already 12,000 years ago, humans have uh, modified three quarters of the land uh, in our, on our planet. If this would have happened somewhere else in the universe, uh, we would uh, we might refer to it as terraforming. Terraforming is this concept that comes from uh, science fiction where words are engineered in order to sustain life uh, coming from our planet. Uh, if we remove for a moment the fictional element uh, of this word, we would realize that the difference between uh, the terraforming that is happening elsewhere and the one that happened here is that the first one was planned while this one is not. Sensing technology and statistical modeling enabled us to see, to actually see the crisis that we, that we are currently living on. As you probably already know, a third of uh, greenhouse gases emissions uh, and uh, as well as uh, 1.3 billion tons of waste uh, are produced by the current agricultural system. And yet we still have to produce more food uh, in order to meet uh, the requirements of a growing population by 2050. And we have to do so in a way that it's equ equitable, nutritious, delicious, and most importantly, carbon negative. Our project, Black Almanac, uh, is a speculative design research database uh, that underlies 30 steps uh, for a viable food system by 2050. Its name is inspired by the most fertile soil on our planet, uh, a variation of which can be found in the Amazon, where it's named uh, Terra Preta, Black Earth. Scientists have struggled for decades to find the origin of this soil, uh, to realize that uh, it's not naturally formed, uh, it's actually anthropogenic. It was generated by men, by indigenous Amazonian, when they threw kitchen waste uh, outside of their home and they reach the ground uh, with charcoal. Despite that, we still like to draw a line that separates sharply concepts like natural and artificial, whole and molecular, local and global. Terra Preta offers uh, a different approach to it, uh, an alternative narrative, uh, a collaboratory uh, synthesis that will benefit both humans uh, and the land uh, that we tend. For thousands of years, uh, farmers have collected rain tables, uh, seed cycles, lunar charts uh, in almanacs, uh, those intergenerational uh, records uh, of agricultural production. They were first recorded and engraved uh, in stone tablets uh, and later in bounded books. Today, we don't have uh, a single holistic uh, almanac. Instead, we have a pool of data in the form of uh, soil and climate analytics, uh, recipes, patents, uh, as well as genomic uh, database. Nevertheless, new ways of seeing agriculture cannot happen if we are fixated on outdated models of farming that are kept in place uh, by culinary conservatism, uh, dead-end culture wars that are not leading nowhere, and perverse subsidies. Instead of rejecting the so-called uh, factory farming, we should uh, need more intimacy with the ideas and the infrastructure that will allow the production of affordable ecological food at scale. 
I would like to finish with a case study from uh, the early Soviet Union uh, where apartments were built uh, with no kitchen. Instead, people were dining in factory kitchen, a new architectural typology uh, where complete chains of production, preparation, consumption, all gastronomic experience uh, were delivered to their users. Uh, how would a contemporary factory kitchen look like if it was built around the concept of planetary cuisine, aiming for population scale nutrition, uh, but at factory size uh, footprint? Slow food for ground, the cultural significance that we attach to food, uh, but alone it cannot scale to meet a booming, the requirement of a booming population. Fast food is criticized, but it has been around for millennia, as the picture from Pompeii showed. Instead of alienation from, the, from new, like neophobia, we need to realize that food has never been static. New dishes, flavor, mode of preparation are constantly being created. Humans are 0.01% of biomatter. And it's in this 0.01% uh, that still live billions of microorganisms uh, in this biological symbiosis uh, that predate us, uh, but at the same time made possible metabolism uh, and immune health. Food is never truly whole, and neither are we. There is no sharp boundary between human and nature there is no outside to which we don't belong. Instead, there is a garden of aliens, interdependent aliens. And it's the recognition that this alienation is crucial in defining and making possible to make Earth our second home. Thank you. Hello. My name is Salma Sirri. I'm a food history researcher. Can you all hear me all right? Okay. Um, you know that saying, tell me what you eat and I tell you what you are? Well, I'll tell you two things. Um, first is that as a fourth generation migrant of this city, uh, this was my, the previous slide was my, um, my breakfast, typical breakfast with Egyptian rumi cheese, then Iranian ashrashte, uh, Punjabi samosa, and a vimto. And, um, you know, the thing is that I, would, I usually struggle with the second bit, tell me who you are. Um, not because of the diversity. I mean, the, mostly the only thing that's common between all these uh, elements is my stomach, right? Um, but because of the missing parts, I struggle with finding my own food history and my own past through food in uh, places like this city in Dubai. Um, my past is usually undocumented um, as a migrant. It's rarely considered as legitimate enough to be part of um, you know, uh, food history of the region and museums and textbooks. And so I became really interested in this idea of disappearance. It's almost like my food history has disappeared. Uh, but not just in Dubai. Uh, I'm interested in the history of disappearance of food in the Southwest Asia and North Africa as a larger uh, region. So I research and study um, and write about that. Um, and you know, when it comes to this idea of disappearance, it's inevitable. It has to happen. We all disappear at some point. But certain cultures are more prone and more vulnerable to this um, idea of disappearance than others. Um, national uh, idea, the notion of national cuisines and national heritage is one catalyst. Another catalyst is just the mere passing of time. Another fact is that uh, where we are in the region and the fact of the oral culture is so prominent, there is rarely back in the day the reason to document our uh, past but more uh, the stories would transfer in oral culture from a grandmother to a daughter to a granddaughter. And so migrants as a group are um, more susceptible, but 
definitely not that ethnic ra uh, racial minorities is also part of that um, I mean you've got a lot of diversity in the region and it becomes so prominent to document these forgotten or overlooked histories um, with that human movement because when people move throughout geography part of that movement also disappears so the act of archiving is really, really important. I find, I locate, I go out in flea markets, I try to salvage old cookbooks, uh, talk to grandmothers, document an oral heritage. And so I managed to put together more than almost 500 pieces of these archival materials for our uh, culture. So let's talk about... Um, why migrant food is important. I mean, the basic need to recreate that food and flavors and textures uh, is for, for us as community like migrants to recreate the sense of home is so, so important. Uh, be, for here's an example of uh, Afghan bakeries in Abu Dhabi. Um, their food might not make it as part of a national heritage, but that does not mean that we, you know, we should overlook that heritage. Another example is um, contested societies. Uh, we've got the case of the oranges from Yaffa. We're talking about that. Um, it becomes really, really important because otherwise the narrative will be overlooked by the colonizer and deemed, you know, illegitimate or claimed. Another example is the cookbooks offer a huge, huge resource for us. Just from the design of the book, you can tell so much. Uh, you can tell so much about, um, you know, the, the ways the recipes are written. Uh, the system of knowledge of these cookbooks were used in home economics education system, for instance. And so archiving is extremely important. But, you know, we shouldn't stop there. Archives, just for the sake of archiving and for that nostalgic feel. I mean, we're all familiar with one or two sources on Instagram now where, you know, you go in and you find a lot of material from the past. And it's nice to see. It's nice to look at. But beyond looking at the context, it becomes just you know, something that we look at for enjoyment. This is an example of how context becomes so important. It, there's clear, obvious links in this 1950s uh, package uh, that links to race and, and uh, issues of s uh, slavery, right? This is another example, a letter from the Trucial Oman Scouts, what used to be Dubai back in the day, where uh, British soldiers were uh, debating how Arab soldiers would eat. Should they eat with the British soldiers or separate? Should they have the same food or not? And so, you know, power imbalances really comes through. Um, here's another example of another piece. Advertisement becomes so valuable for us as researchers. Through that, we find how gender was um, used and mobilized by politicians, such as this piece of 1950s Egypt. Um, another example is a cookbook from communities, expert, uh, you know, American expat communities in, in um, Saudi Arabia, um, where you see a lot of use of replacements for ingredients, and it tells you what was important for them to be excluded or included in their uh, cookbooks. And so without, the, without actually pushing these archives forward, um, I was just in Lebanon the other day and I attended a workshop in which Kristen Sheed, um, a scholar, uh, mentioned that archives usually think that they look back when they're actually looking forward. They're looking in, you know, to the future. And so without us really engaging into um, the context, the bigger picture, to know who we are, where we come from, our little stories that might not be told, um, perhaps the future <laughs> is not as inclusive as we would love it to be. Thank you very much. The first time I harvested a nest of weaver ants, I had ants in my pants, literally. And let me tell you, that's not where you want them ever. I harvested them as a permaculture designer at a food forest in India, really as a means of pest control. It was only later that I was told they're perfectly edible. As I ground them into chutney, I began to wonder, 
was this the first time that anybody was eating ants? Who else ate them? Why hadn't I eaten them before? Which other insects did we eat? <sighs> this led to the creation of my project, Bucci. Bucci is an interdisciplinary exploration of entomophagy or the practice of eating insects. I initiated it at the Serendipity Art Foundation's Food Lab in 2021, and I focused on the Indian context of entomophagy. Our oceans are overfished. Our forests are decimated. Conventional animal protein is, is, is literally killing this planet. Globally, people have come to recognize insects as a resilient, regenerative source of protein and potentially the food of the future. Over 2 billion people in the world currently eat insects. My project began with a recipe collection. I collaborated with Dr. Lobeno Mozui and designer Shiva Kant Vyas to research and document recipes of insects from different regions of my country. We focused on the tribal belt, which is co commonly where this practice is witnessed. We documented recipes for carpenter worms, silkworms, and weaver ants. We documented them from, over three, from three different tribes, and through the process of this documentation, came to realize how marginalized these food cultures were from mainstream food, Indian food culture. The process of this research taught me about preservation and harvesting methods. It taught me about t uh, techniques to forage. It taught me market rates. It taught me about s supply chains. But most, it taught me about gender roles and how that plays out in the market. But most importantly, what it taught me was India has a really rich history of insect eating. At this point, I had a lot of questions. I couldn't understand why we didn't have more information about this. I decided that the next step would be to have conversations with experts and ask them my questions. This was a series I conducted on Instagram called The Lab Goes Live, in association with the Serendipity Art Foundation. My first guest was Dr. Dolly Kikon, a Naga anthropologist in the University of Melbourne. Dr. Kikon and I talked about food identity, caste, and, and the barriers that caste places on us accessing the, futures, the solutions of the future. We talked about how food is often a tool used to create and cultivate the other. I spoke to Dr. Julie Lesnick, the world's only entomophagy anthropologist. We spoke about her book, Human Evolution and Edible Insects, and a very unique relationship shared between women and insects. And in, in, that, in the same vein, reproductive ev evolution. I spoke to chefs Pratik Sadhu and Geetika Saikya about the role that chefs might play in addressing the food crisis, the way we access nutrition, and perhaps even the role of innovation. What could we do to start getting people to open up their minds and broaden their palates? I spoke to Mitali Puvaya, who's a commercial, well, she's a neuroscientist and a commercial insect farmer in Bangalore. She's farming the black soldier fly larvae on kitchen compost and using this to, f to create dog food and potentially even human food in the future. This is, in my opinion, the insect of the future. The, the, the third part of my project was the fun part. I got to experience and figure out what insects would taste like in my kitchen. I collaborated with Payal Shah of Kobo Fermentry to explore and dive into the world of ferm fermentation and insects. The first thing we did was create an insect-based amino sauce, or garum. We used koji to ferment weaver ants, grasshoppers, and black soldier fry to create a, a sauce that might actually be an alternative to soy and fish sauce. We were heavily inspired by the Noma, the Noma Guide to Fermentation and Koji Alchemy. We created an um, amino paste based out of insects, more commonly um, known as a miso. Um, we did this using grasshoppers, weaver ants, black soldier fly, and cricket, and koji, of course. Um, could this potentially be an, a, a different way to use and access protein? Um, the last thing I did was to culminate my project, I invited a bunch of food nerds into my kitchen and cooked insects. We made cricket-based rotis, we made weaver ant chutney, we even made a cricket and weaver ant chocolate bar and sat down together and ate a meal. 
as we sat down on our table, we asked ourselves two, we found ourselves asking two important questions. How come more of us weren't eating insects? And what's really stopping us from embracing insect, insect protein as a future food? Why were we so, so resistant? It came down really to three things. Fear, mostly of the unknown, um, came down to disgust, something that we actually thought was an uh, intuitive ability to protect ourselves, but also a social cultural phenomenon that could be taught and could be learned. Most importantly, it came down to erasure, erasure of information and erasure of past that we didn't want to accept anymore. What will the future look like? What will the future be? This is, after all, a, a conversation about the future of food. And so I ask, what will the future taste like? Uh, this is the question that has been at the core of my research and my work. I don't know yet if I have the answer, but this optimist within me says that it will taste of hope, it will taste of change, and it will taste of resilience. Thank you. How many of you know where your food comes from? Or who are the producers and farmers behind the food that you eat? At Producers Trust, we're transforming the way in which farmers and added value producers are marketing their farms and products. At its core, the problem that we solve is producers' equity. 50% of the two billion smallholder farmers in the world are globally in absolute poverty. And food production uh, is responsible for 26% of the greenhouse gas emissions. We desperately need to lift farmers out of poverty so that we can sustain our planet in growing human populations. Today, more than ever, consumers are de demanding transparency, best, better practices, and impacts from the brands that they purchase. So marketing, is really the greatest opportunity for us to transition humanity into a more food, sorry, more resilient food and agricultural model. So what if tomorrow uh, you could experience the foods that you purchase and consume at the farm level, where you can go on a journey of discovering and learning everything about the produ producers and farmers um, can offer and about the products you buy and eat, completely trusting and transparent. At Producers Trust, we've been hard at work the past four years, putting in, to, in place the partnerships necessary um, to design this experience for you, which requires strong global support from public and private entities that are willing to create an ecosystem that empowers small farmers. Till today, we have 900 organizations on the platform uh, that represent over 2 million farmers globally. So where are they registered? They're on our marketplace. They're on an online global marketplace that connects you directly with the farmers. So what we do essentially is we cut out the middlemen. We remove a lot of the people that are in between where products can get to you more directly. What's unique about our marketplace is that the stories we feature there are about the farmers themselves. We offer you the opportunity to authentically learn about every product and individual and the process behind the scenes. This generally isn't information that you can find anywhere. Producers market is growing steadily, adding new categories and experiences and we are scaling our company globally to include not only food, but also healthcare products, fashion industry, and also um, home products too. So please visit our website and check out the website. Our second product is Storybird. Storybird is gonna take you one step further and show you the exact journey of the product, um, sorry, the exact journey the product went on to arrive to your plate. Storybird educates consumers to make more informed, conscious purchasing decisions that align with your values and the kind of impacts that you wanna see in the world. So how does it work? Uh, with a click of a button or a scan of a QR code, 
on the product packaging or on an e-commerce website, you can explore, trace, and trust the validated stories from your favorite brands. We work closely with brands and producers to identify the value chain steps that, produ that products travel along the entire supply chain to ensure that the stories are authenticated with the blockchain partners that we have within our ecosystem. Of course, through other third party um, partners as well, we're trying to look at certifying bodies that can support us in ensuring that these are in place. For brands, this means an increase in sales for access, sorry, by accessing an, an audience that wants transparency more than ever. For producers, this means getting your authentic story out into the market, connecting you, connecting directly to more to the customers. Okay, so let's break it down. Basically, this is what a story bird looks like if you would scan it on our QR code. That QR code, if you scan it, it'll show you this. What you'll see is the story, the values, the different values that the customer, uh, sorry, the producer has, and then of course their certifications and their, the story about the, the farm. Then you'll see the product journey with the supply chain steps and an interactive map, map to show you exactly where it came from. So at every step within the supply chain from planting to harvesting to the retail point or online, wherever you may be purchasing it, you'll be able to see that. This is a deeper layer of information that we can provide within the Storybird about the organizations themselves and a group of small holder farmers. So we call these facilities, and facilities can tell the story of hundreds of thousands of producers that are behind the products that you are eating. No Seafood, based out of Boston, uh, has an, a direct-to-consumer website where their entire business model is based off of the, our technology, where they're providing transparency with the Storybird for every single product on there. As I mentioned earlier, we can also do, sorry, integrate this technology into other product categories like the fashion industry. Producers can list multiple products from their organization and create an ecosystem of Storybirds for their customers. Our capabilities are just starting and with this technology, and we can't wait to create more immersive, trusting experiences for our customers. So join us as we empower producers and shift food systems into a more transparent, trusting model. Thank you. All right. All right, I'd like to introduce you to one of the biggest threats that humanity is facing. And this is coming from livestock farming. You might think that animals are not a threat to us because they provide us with food, with nutrients also. But it depends a lot on the perspective. You have to take into account what's the impact they're having. And in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, if you compare it to the transport sector, they are emitting more methane and CO2 than the transport itself. So this is a little bit scary, uh, but obviously there is a reason for it. And the reason comes down to the excessive consumption that we are making of animal origin products. Or at least it might depend on what's, on what's the way we are farming these animals. So now we are consuming over 300 million tons of meat every year, uh, notwithstanding the consumption of animal origin products. We have cheese, uh, eggs, uh, milk, you name it. There's... For, for every taste, we have something, so that, that's not the point. But the point is the source of emissions that we have in farms. We have, for sure, the soil respiration because we have to come up with crops, with feed stuff for animals. We have NOx coming from the manure, uh, obviously fire, and biomasses are producing CO2. But at the center of the farm, for sure, there are animals. So you can see from cattle to chickens, more ruminants. On the far right, you would have humans. Everyone is emitting gas. I, I'm sure you know this. Uh, you could call it enteric emission. It's fine, but it's methane. Uh, everyone is aware of this. And we really have to come up with ways to help farmers to make farming more sustainable. The first ones to understand this have been supranational institutions like the EU, which is coming out with very strict regulations. 
but the farmers don't really have tools to control it, and no control at all over the emissions. So what can be done here? Well, something that many think is that we can go with alternatives to animal-based diets. True, uh, we could go with uh, meat, which is cultured meat. Okay, we can try, but we don't have time for this now. We have to fight climate change now. It, it, it's not likely that everyone is going to turn vegan in, I don't know, two months, two years. Not going to happen. Good news, we have a new unique source of information, which is the microbiome. Uh, this, this kind of source can give us details about the internal status of the animal, and ideally it could do it in real time. We're not there yet, but technology is going forward. And I'd like you to think of the microbiome as of an orchestra made of fungi, bacteria, viruses, where you don't have the good and the evil, but you have a community that has to produce a melody. And the key word here is the community, because this is not the single community that we have. There are different kinds of microbiomes, um, and there is, I'll wait for the next slide. <laughs> there is the oral microbiome, there is the skin microbiome, there are many other kinds of microbiomes, and then there is the gut microbiome, which is strictly connected to digestion and health. Because it's connected to digestion, we know for sure it's something that relates to gas emissions as well. And as far as I am concerned, and as the scientific community is concerned, the microbiome now is proven to be strictly connected to the nervous system. So it is what happens in your intestine, the bacteria in your intestine are modulating your neuroplasticity, just little, affecting little by little, but it's not something huge. And there is a very huge impact on the immune system. So what we want to do, what we should do, is we should have healthier animals which have a more balanced microbiome so that we can eat safer food. We would have our own more balanced microbiome if we would be, you know, uh, our health would be way better also. But it's not just about eating one ingredient, one key ingredient. It really depends on the diet. This is what is going to control and modulate your microbiome. The diet, the genetics, the social interactions, especially in rich environments. So everyone should have a very exciting life with friends. Temperature and humidity, also everything that's coming from external sources, everything coming from the environment is extremely important. Since when? Since the, the moment we come to life. And this is the feed conversion ratio, which is something very useful when we talk about farmers, because they reason like this. They think how much kilos of feed are producing how much kilos of product. It really changes, it changes a lot for animals. And the product could be milk, it could be meat. It changes with that. So it's a little bit more complicated than this because we have many different animals with many different microbiomes. Obviously, the microbiome of a fish is not the same as the microbiome of a cow. And there is a lot of variability between individuals. So for farmers, it's a little bit complicated to understand how to, how to you know, face this problem. As for Melody, uh, we are trying to provide them with a very simple system to follow. They would have to follow very easy recommendation that we would generate starting from the traditional data on farm by integrating the microbiome in this reasoning. Because with this biological sample knowledge, we can really go farther. We ship them a kit. They just have to collect a biological sample. Vets do this. They ship it back to us, and then we extract the DNA, and we look at the microbiome sequence. Basically, we can tell what bacteria are there, what viruses are there, and in which quantity. And what we really want to do in the end is we want to correlate this data with the traditional farming data to find new parameters. I've been telling you about the diet. I've been telling you about uh, you know, the social environment. But we really want to correlate to anything. And we could do this very easily because we work with machine learning. But it's not simply machine learning because it seems like a keyword that solves anything. The good news is that the modern farm is extremely full, filled with data. There's a data overload. They don't know what to do with it because it's too complicated for them. So it's good to just take it all, aggregate it, and come out with very simple outcomes to follow. Uh, this is what we think could be one of the ways to achieve better animal health because we could prevent outbreaks uh, you know, when virus spreads or bacteria spread, but also food safety because, uh, as I said, there are many alternatives. They are crazy good. But we really have to be careful to what we're reaching today, not necessarily tomorrow. That's it. Good evening, everyone. 
since I started being involved, more and more involved into the subject, I realized one very important thing. The only reason today to eat animal product is simply taste buds and culture. Uh, I'm Patrick, and I'm going to discuss with you why the future of food is plant-based. But prior to that, a little bit on uh, my background. Ten years ago, we had a concept that was rejected by everyone uh, because we were not an international brand. So we knocked on the only door that actually opened, the, the only people that opened their door to us, and it was Altercal Avenue, where we created four different concepts. The first concept that we created uh, is Good Vibes Market. And it's a street food market that brings together homegrown concepts. Uh, the response was amazing. And from there, we have a lot of well-established brands that actually started with us. After this, we created Inked. Uh, for those who know us already, just one second. Inked is a creative food and event platform. We, uh, we did over the last few years over 300 events from pop-up to uh, chef's table, private dinners, uh, full immersive dinners, and international, international event. Inked was created based on passion for food, passion for event, and passion for innovation. After that, obviously, our friend COVID came and everything stopped. So we had to rethink our relationship with food, and we had to rethink how we're going to survive at that time. And also, there was an urge to help other people in, in crisis. So, Part of the Alcercal Avenue Paid Forward program, we worked all together and then we were cooking 400 meals a day for the three months during COVID and uh, we also attracted uh, some of the best chefs in Dubai that helped us in that, uh, in what we were trying to do and it was really heartwarming to see how everybody actually came together at that time. Past COVID, we, uh, my passion for plant-based food started even before, but my passion started and we created Incognito where I said it was a must to have 50% of the menu being plant-based to show people that plant-based food can also taste amazing. After that, my <laughs> the second um, concept that we created is Mobi. Mobi is a plant-based Japanese inspired cafe where uh, we wanted to create innovative dishes and uh, also, it's a perfect segue for the actual subject, why I believe that the future of food is plant-based. So why plant-based? First of all, when we discuss about water, we know that to produce one kilogram of meat, we need about 15 to 20,000 liters of water um, versus to produce one kilogram of potato, for example, we only need 100 to 300, depending on where you get your data from. So that alone is an information that we need to sink in to understand when we know that water is going to be very rare. We know as well that 25% of the global greenhouse emission come from farming, and some of the other speakers spoke about it. And we know that that's especially from livestock. So that's very, very important for us to look at it at this data. Deforestation as well. Um, animal agriculture is the main reason for deforestation. When we know today that one of the solutions to reverse climate change is to actually plant trees to have more oxygen pumped into the air, we understand that animal agriculture is not helping us at all uh, for that matter as well. Animal rights is the main reason why I became vegan myself. When we know that 90 billion farmed animals are killed every single year, not talking about the trillions of fish. For what? For absolutely no reason except what I said at the beginning, which is taste buds. It's not just about animal rights. It's about human wrong when we know that 900 million people are hungry every year. It's absolutely absurd to feed 90 billion farmed animals and we can't feed 900 million people when we know that 1 kg of food is 14 kg Sorry, 1 kg of meat is for 10 kg of food for the animal. Um, <clears throat> we also have the biodiversity subject that is very important. Uh, the <laughs> land field and the loss of land is the main uh, reason for loss of habitats for animals. And in the sea, it's the, we are losing twice more species than inland because with the, with the water heating, there's absolutely nowhere for the animals to actually, or for the marine animal to go somewhere. We are at the tipping point. Today, when one of the speakers was talking about that, 
today when we know that animal agriculture is more harmful for the environment than all the actual transportation combined, we actually need to think about it and change. Change from an individual perspective. As an individual, the main um, action that we can take is to be plant-based. That's the main action for us to be able to shift that. That's a, that's a base, and then we can look at uh, potentially shop locally, seasonally, etc. We also have um, collective effort that we need to do here where companies need to offer more plant-based dishes. I'm pushing all my friends in the restaurant industry to have at least 25% of their menu being, uh, being plant-based. And at the same time, there's a lot of uh, restaurant opening that have more and more plant-based options. It's very important to look at the entrepreneur today. 10, 12 years ago, entrepreneur dreamed about a lookalike meat like Impossible Food and Beyond Meat. They were in the RD uh, at that time. Today, there are huge companies. We have new entrepreneurs, we have new businesses that has been presented today to fight all of that, and we all should look at that. For me, the only way out is in. When you think about it, if every single decision made by every single individual today is made based on universal love, imagine the changes that we can have in this world, and that has absolutely no room for animal agriculture as well. I'm going to pass, us this, uh, pass on the stage to my friend Daniel, who's going to talk to you about food waste, which is another subject that is very dear to my heart, and uh, he's going to give you way more insights on that. Thank you very much. It's always great to see familiar faces. We still judge the book by the cover. And this is a standard towards food. And this is crazy, costing a lot of waste. And I mean food waste that we all do at home and in supermarkets. And not just in supermarkets, on the production line. In a world where more than 800 million people still go to bed without a meal. I mean, it's just massive. Think about it for a moment. I mean, think about it. Just really, really think about it. You waste food and people go to bed without a meal. I mean, for me, that's just crazy. I can't think about it more than I have already done. My name is Daniel. I've been lucky enough to travel around the world and I called Dubai home for almost a decade. Well, it's a beautiful city. We all love what we eat. We all love the city. But this is not the case for everybody. When I return home, and when I mean home, I'm talking about Nigeria, where I'm from, the issue is even massive. People don't have access to food. And this is about the inequality. There are about 36 million people who cannot afford food today. In my last visit, I find that COVID has even accelerated this issue further, costing people I don't even know who are texting me for money for food. And I had to ask myself, what will I do? So I started to think, can I do this alone? It did not sit well with me that on the one hand, we are throwing so much food, and on the other hand, People don't have access to a decent meal. Does it make any sense? Think about it for a minute. People are hungry. So I started to think, in fact, the waste that we create is so crazy, and we as individuals are also the culprits of this waste. In Europe, for instance, 50% of food waste is at the consumer level. That's about 44 million tons. But you might not understand what 4 million tons looks like. In the MENA region, that number is even higher. Food waste by individuals is 50% higher than somebody in Europe, costing people to go to bed without food. That's about 55 million people in the MENA region don't have access to food. And also, food waste is not just about the food waste in the house. It's also prompted by those promotions that we all love. Buy one, get one free. When we go into supermarket, we take those food, we take them home, but we end up wasting them. And this becomes an issue. And 
one in third of every food that we actually produce today doesn't reach the consumer. Do you know why? It doesn't reach the consumer just because we start assuming that this one is too big, it's too small, it's too wonky, or it's too ugly. And or just because, you know, the expiration dates that we see on labels, we believe that food, we cannot eat it. And this is a massive pro problem, especially when we rely so much on labels. We're no more connected to food like it's supposed to be. And this is a massive issue, particularly when we waste food, it comes to a cost to the environment, especially when 8% of the total greenhouse gas emission is coming from food. If you put that into context, that's about 87% of the total road transportation emission that we have today. And as an individual, when you waste food, you find that 1% of that particular food is about 1% of total fruit and vegetables that is being wasted. And that's why I started Irogo, an online platform that aims to eliminate food waste by automating discounts, therefore prompting affordability, accessibility, and making Dubai and the world safer. In this process, I would explain that you are able to automate what you buy on your weekly basis. We work with local farmers, wholesalers, to automate their excess produce they can sell due to changing demand. And we pack this on a box and we send this to you on a weekly basis. This not only makes you reduce your weekly box, but it's a perfect way for a farmer to be able to sell those ugly produce that supermarkets are being rejected. And this way, you're able to reclaim the resources, the water that went into making food. Making sure that we as individuals are in a position where we can take that practical step to actually promote affordability, seasonality, farm to fork, in a way where this helps make the society better. And most importantly, it starts now. It starts today. And we as individuals need to start thinking as one, not in isolation. I'm talking about also the government organizations, policymakers, to ensure that those things that prompt food waste costing a lot of people who don't have access to food, are able to have more access. Especially when a lot of people by the year 2030 would not have access to food. I'm talking about the SDG 2030 goals. We want to eliminate that. It starts from us fighting zero hunger. So fighting food waste is also fighting uh, food security. And we can all do this together to make sure that we can not only you know, feed the people who are hungry, but to also make the world a better place. Thank you. Good on you. Hello, good evening. Food is fundamental. It's fundamental for our existence. Bon appetit, enjoy your meal. We all need food every day. This is enshrined in UN charters. It is, is enshrined in our culture. It forms our culture and our culture influences the food we eat. But the environmental footprint of the food that we are eating is huge and our current food system is simply unsustainable. To produce the food to put on our plates, this requires half the land that humans use. It uses three quarters of all the water that we use, and it's the second biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Furthermore, a third of the food that we produce is produced under irrigation, and every aquifer that is being used for irrigating that one third of our food production is being depleted. We are unsustainably mining our water resources to produce a lot of our food. The food system is unsustainable, it has to change. Furthermore, 
we're having to produce 70% more food over the next 30 years, and we have to do this in the teeth of accelerating climate change. Overall, the food system has to change. Fortunately, although the need for this is great, in fact, it's imperative, in fact, it's not negotiable. Although the need is great, so too are the opportunities. We've got a whole range of things, fantastic talks being given today, all sorts of people innovating. And I'm one of the people who are trying to use some technologies, new technologies, to try to make a contribution. We can use information technologies and biotechnologies, and that's where my company, Red Sea Farms, emerged. We're trying to reduce the environmental footprint of our food production by breaking what we call the food, water, energy nexus. We can try to save water when we're producing our food, but that takes energy. Or we can try to save energy to produce our food, but that takes water. We're trying to crack that trap that we're locked in. And we brought together three scientists from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, spun out our company. There's a plant scientist, an agricultural engineer, and a material scientist. Some of the technologies I'm going to give you now. We can use Internet of Things, sensors, information capture, and then use artificial intelligence to help make decision-making in agriculture to make things more efficient. We can use material science. Daria Baran, one of our co-founders, a material scientist, she's developed a solar panel made out of organic molecules that she's tuned to absorb in the infrared reducing the heat load in the greenhouse, reducing the energy needed in the greenhouse, and generating energy to be used in the greenhouse. It's what you would call a win-win situation. We can use engineering, supported by all sorts of modern methods, to substitute a lot of the fresh water that we use in a greenhouse with seawater. We can use seawater to also control the humidity in the greenhouse, and we can even cool the greenhouse at night when the humidity is extremely high in the middle of summer. This leads to a massive saving in the water that's used for our food production. Do you know, when you buy a kilogram of tomatoes, that is usually taking, in this region, about 350 litres of water. That's a third of a tonne of water for one kilogram of tomatoes. Using our technologies, we can reduce that down to about 20 litres of water, an over tenfold reduction. And you can do more. The energy demands in a greenhouse match exactly the energy supply in a greenhouse from solar panels. So we can connect cheaply solar panels directly to our greenhouse. No need for batteries, no need for inverters. And that really does help reduce the carbon footprint of our food production. Plant science and biotechnologies can really make also a significant contribution. We're living in the middle of a revolution here with genomics and other biotechnologies improving our health, well, it can also improve our food production. And one of the things we can do now, which has never been possible before at the speed that we can do now, is to go out and look at the wild plants which are around us and see if we can adapt them to become profitably useful for us to contribute to our food system. We call this neo-domestication. And this little critter here grows in full seawater. It's called salicornia, or sea asparagus. It produces an oil-rich seed. 30% of the oil of the seed is oil. You squeeze it out, it's got properties just like sunflower oil. We can cook with it. We can actually also use it as a lubricant in engines. And so we're what we call domesticating that plant, turning it into a profitable crop. We can also get wild relatives of plants and use properties in those wild relatives to make existing crops more tolerant. So here we've got tomatoes and the wild relatives of the tomatoes that can grow even on the edges of the sea and integrate those traits into our commercial tomatoes to help us grow them. So we've developed a rootstock now which has been grown in northern Egypt by smallholder farmers who are on the low quality soil, salty soil at the mouth of the River Nile and the grafted rootstocks that we've developed are helping those farmers increase their yields. Quinoa, superfood, super crop, but it's very heat sensitive. It can grow in salty soils and dry soils, but it's adapted to life at 4,000 meters. Wouldn't it be great if we could use that crop in North Africa and Middle East and West Asia? It's got some relatives that grow in very hot regions in Argentina, 
and we're now able to bring in the heat tolerance from those wild relatives. So that's just giving you a quick introduction to some of the things that we're trying to do, making contributions to improve the sustainability of our food system. We're using research, primary scientific research, and trying to deliver this. We came out from KAUST, and we're bringing together a range of technologies because we need as much help as we can. The imperative to improve our food system is, is overwhelming, but fortunately, the opportunities are enormous as well. Thank you very much. A big thank you to all of our wonderful speakers and their fantastic initiatives. A big round of applause. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to the Australian Pavilion for being our wonderful hosts. A reminder, if you have signed up for the food tour with Deepak, Deepak Unni Krishnan called This Is Not A Food Tour, please find our colleagues up front. If you have a yellow lanyard, they will bring you to uh, the start of the tour upstairs. If you have not signed up, uh, the pavilion has kindly offered to expedite some tours into the experiences, in which case you can also go up front and show your lanyard with the blue text. Thank you again for joining us and have a lovely evening. <laughs>